What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical, average American, here today to react and continue learning about things that British people love. Part two. If you haven't seen part one, feel free to go check that out or stay here in part two. That's perfectly fine as well. But in part one, I started learning some very interesting things about British culture and honestly, some things that British people love that caught me by surprise. Uh, some of these things in part one, like meal deals. <laughs> the, the meal deals. Like, I understand the idea of getting a good deal on your lunch or something, but the idea that this is very, very popular in Britain is kind of interesting to me and something that doesn't really exist in the same way here in America for some reason. Maybe we're just getting all of our our deals from McDonald's or something. Maybe that's why it doesn't exist. Uh, what else was there in part one? Queuing? <laughs> Queuing did not surprise me, actually. I have heard that British people do love the queuing, and I love that about British people. Uh, we have, in America, we could definitely learn something about that. Uh, David Attenborough talking about the weather. <laughs> Some of these are actually pretty funny. Um, odd flavored crisps? Apparently British people love odd flavored crisps. That's just a little strange, but you know what? Whatever you like, that's fine. Sporting rivalries, makes sense. Pubs, that's very British. Pub quizzes and saying way or, or like cheering when people drop uh, stuff, glasses in pubs. That's, that was very funny as well. These are honestly all really fun like really cool things that British people love. So I'm actually quite excited to, to finish this in part two here and see what else are some things that British people love that are quite different to, to things that we think about here in America. This has been quite entertaining for me actually. So let's take a look. When it comes to the big British institutions like the monarchy or the BBC, opinions are often divided here. How the BBC, this is a uh, British, Broadcasting Corporation, they do a lot of stuff, I gotta say. All sorts of like TV channels and radio and you even YouTube stuff. I've heard of them. Are they like the most, they must be the most popular broadcasting network in Britain. They're the freaking BBC for crying out loud. It's in their name. Um, do Brits love the BBC? <laughs> However, I'd say generally speaking, Brits still have a lot of warmth and affection for the BBC. Okay. For so many of- I, I know it's been around for a very, very long time. So like for that reason, kind of things that make you feel kind of warm and fuzzy are often things that have been around a long time. They give you a sense of comfort in being there. Maybe that's the, the BBC, you know? I think that's why David Attenborough was in part one. And here, BBC, kind of for a similar reason of us it's been the source of news and entertainment since we were children yeah and i think it's always been synonymous with quality and impartiality now okay i know that you could debate this right and the bbc has its flaws like any institution but it still has a place in the hearts of many brits okay Top shows like match of the day uh, this is okay i'm starting to understand not even just it's not even just for the news element of the bbc it, it also like creates a lot of like great TV programs, right? And shows that people love, I think. EastEnders and Strictly Come Dancing still get millions of viewers. Right. And I personally can't imagine a Britain without the BBC. Right. Number 13, <laughs> a cup of tea. <laughs> here we go. Finally, I'm shocked it took this long to get here. Cup of tea. In part one, um, I was even talking about like, you know, I hope this list is interesting. And it's not just, oh, things British people love tea. Um, that is the one thing that Americans literally think about when we think of things British people might love. We all think of tea here in America. It's just the stereotype. It's synonymous. I think there's a pretty strong element of truth to it as well. So it belongs on the list, but I just think it's funny. Like how much more quintessential British can you get? Uh, they love their tea. Okay. <laughs> we bloody love tea. And there's this belief that it can solve everything. Oh. There's never a time when you shouldn't have a cup of tea. Oh. Get a promotion. 
have a cup of tea. Get <laughs> fired, have a cup of tea. Your football team loses in the last minute, have a cup of tea. I didn't know about that. I didn't know, I didn't know tea can just solve anything. Tea can be a... There, there can be any reason for a cup of tea. Any reason. Nothing is off limits. That's funny. In the south of England, we say cuppa, and in the north, they say a brew. You add milk. Cuppa. I've heard that. Cuppa. I've heard that. I never understood what that meant. Uh, wow. <laughs> I'm having like an epiphany here. That's a slang, like a word for tea. I always thought it was like cuppa tea. And I'm always waiting for them to finish the sentence and say tea. Because I've heard people say a cuppa. And I'm like, cuppa, cuppa what? Cu a cup of tea, right? That's what we're talking about. Why don't you say tea? And it's like, that's the, that's like a word, a slang word. Wow. Okay. And a brew, which is interesting. Here in America, a brew means beer, but it means tea in Britain. I did not know that. <laughs> Milk, sugar, if you want it, and maybe a cheeky biscuit to dunk in your drink. Perfection. Of course. Number 14, banter. <laughs> what is banter? Okay. Well, it's playful, humorous conversation between people. Okay. It can often be teasing and joking, but it shouldn't really be mean or malicious. Banter. This is an interesting one. British people love banter. I like this one. I And I think it's true. I think British people do have a certain sense of humor that is different than America, for sure. And British people seem to inject this element of teasing, like like this narrator is telling us. Teasing, almost like, I know, I've heard British people like make fun of their friends, like really make fun of each other to show that you care about each other. And that is, that's funny. Some Americans are kind of into that uh, sense of humor, but a lot of Americans really wouldn't understand the British banter. So I, I like this one. Brits live for banter. It's a very <laughs> bonding thing. We banter about football, uh, bad clothes, silly haircuts, okay. someone's bad taste in music, anything and everything. So it, it's really just like an attitude of like talking, almost like poking fun at life in a way, uh, which I like. You shouldn't take it too, too seriously. Number 15, saying all right and not wanting a response. Spend a few uh, days in the UK and you'll pick this up immediately. Brits okay. love using all right as a greeting, but they aren't looking for an actual answer. So don't reply, yes, I- Oh, oh gosh, this really confused me. I think I know what we're talking about here. Um, this is not a greeting in the United States, which is why it took me a second. All right. Uh, that's a way of saying hello, I think, or how are you in Britain? And <laughs> so here in America, we'd say like, how's it going? How are you doing? And in a similar way, we don't want your life story. We don't really even want to know how you're doing, even though we're saying, how, how, how's it going? Um, we're just hoping that you say, good, thanks. Uh, and I think that's similar in Britain. Uh, although in Britain, he's saying they might not want a response at all. Or, or would you say, if someone says, all right, would you just, could you say, all right, as a re reply? I, I, I'm a little confused here. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. And you, we don't want that. All you have to do is deliver a very casual, all right, or a hi, if you really want. Okay. That's it. The perfect British conversation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so British people love the use of all right because it's efficient you don't have to like carry out these pleasantries uh that no one really wants to do okay i i can get behind that what's this uh fish and chips the other okay okay this is another one a lot of americans are familiar with fish and chips this would be like the second to tea if americans were asked what do british people love americans would be like tea and fish and chips. And funny, <laughs> funny enough, a lot of Americans think that those are stereotypes, but, uh, and, and they are, but I think it's true. I think fish and chips and tea are genuinely loved in Britain. So there's truth to it, which, which is good. <laughs> 16, fish and chips or any Friday night takeaway. All okay. the rumors are true. 
We do love fish and chips. <laughs> okay. I know, more beige food. But it tastes particularly good if you have it by the seaside. Now, for many British wow. families... Yeah, I, I've never had fish and chips. It's not... It, it, I, you'd be hard-pressed to find fish and chips in America. I, I've actually never been anywhere where you can even order that. Maybe if you're by the coast or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, totally a British thing. I've never gotten to experience it. A trip to the chippy on a Friday night is a weekly pilgrimage. The chippy. The ch a trip to the chippy. I can't. <laughs> I love some of these British expressions. Trip to the chippy. So a chippy is like a place where you get fish and chips. That's, that's fantastic. Now, there are regional variations about what to have with your fish and chips. In the north, they like mushy peas, gravy, curry sauce. And in okay. the south, it's more like salt and vinegar, maybe some ketchup, mayonnaise, that kind of thing. And okay. in Scotland, they love to throw a bit of haggis or a Mars bar into a deep fat fryer. <laughs> Just for lols. Just for lols, yeah? Yeah, there is some very interesting British food out there, that's for sure. Fish and chips. Uh, this must be good. This must be really good. Because I've Brit I think it, it's very popular in Britain, and, and it's even popular in other countries as well, I'm pretty sure. Just, yeah, just just fry anything yeah now if you aren't into fish and chips don't worry that's all right because brits have this tradition of a friday night takeaway and the big popular ones okay. are chinese and indian and if you go ah. to any town or village frankly you can get both friday night takeaway um what we would call like takeout in america um and what was he saying he was saying brits really love chinese food which is absolutely true here in america indian food not so much you don't find indian food very often in america um americans really love mexican food um and pizza i'd say those are those would be some of the most popular american friday night takeout i think indian and if you go to any town or village frankly you can get both number huh. 17 saying it's coming home before every football tournament Okay, this one hurts huh? a little bit because this is another football related point that only really pertains to England. But it it's coming home. Okay, okay, like uh like the championship is coming home. The trophy is coming home. I think that's what it means. Uh in America, you know, the vast majority of us in America, we don't watch soccer or football as it uh is called in Britain. So <laughs> I think some Americans use this phrase. I, I understand it. Now that I think about it, it's coming home. Maybe some, like, American football fans or basketball, like, or, or even hockey. Like, the idea of, of the, the trophies coming home, right? Every time there is a major international tournament, everyone starts saying, it's coming home. <laughs> yeah, it's coming home, isn't it? Now, this is a reference to a song lyric from a 1996 anthem, Three Lines, in which the singers oh. claim that football is coming home. And we have this sort of optimism and belief that each year, each tournament, it is coming home. We this is from a song? A specific song lyric? I did, I did not know that. We've been singing this for 20 years, 30 years, <laughs> 30 years. Still waiting. Number okay. 18. Is he talking about a specific tournament or trophy that's coming home to England? What is what is that? Is it like the World Cup or something? I have no idea. I'm totally ignorant on this matter. Okay, mo moving along here. <laughs> Discussing the route to or from somewhere. Now, to be <laughs> honest, this is probably an older man kind of thing. But my huh? goodness, do Brits love discussing how they're going to get somewhere or how... <laughs> This is like in part one, where he was talking about how Brits enjoy uh, talking about the weather <laughs> as like a comfort, like a comfortable discussion to kind of default to. If you don't have anything else to talk about, you can talk about the weather or you can talk about how you're going to go somewhere, the directions. Oh, OK, <laughs> well, they got somewhere. You know, for example, like what route did you take? Or did you take the M1 or the M6? Okay. Which junction did you get off at? Did you avoid the congestion time? <laughs> How was the ring road at this time of day? Brits really love to have these sort of preconceived ideas of um, topics that are really safe to talk about. I didn't know 
Brits loved that so much. <laughs> is, this, is this like a, a deep-seated fear in British culture that you're like going to have an awkward silence and nothing to talk about? So Brits just love directions and weather okay it's a diversion for all southbound traffic oh god oh god why why oh my god <laughs> uh, it seems to bring brits endless joy and i i can't fathom it i don't understand it maybe because <laughs> i haven't got a car but yeah, oh we love talking about traffic and routes <laughs> <You're right. laughs> that is funny do brits really love talking about this or I, f I really feel like it's just like small talk or something. Madness. Number 19, neo-colonial taking over of places in foreign lands. Ah. Now, in these post-colonial times, I've noticed that certain groups of Brits still seem obsessed with claiming territory abroad. Now oh, this is interesting. So he's talking about historically, like Brit Britain, the British Empire, really loved expanding. <laughs> and it's really quite amazing. I've learned a bit more about that history uh, here on YouTube even. And it is very impressive. But uh, what, there's people still to this day who are like uh, kind of talking about like, oh, we technically own this or that or... There are two great examples of this. One is when football fans travel to European cities with their team and they set up camp in the town center uh, okay. in the square. And they'll put up their flags and their banners and they'll sort of take over the bars and cafes, oh. essentially annexing the square. As oh, I didn't know about this. What? This is, it's like a power move, a real power play, a uh, real psychological warfare. Um, British football fans go to other uh, countries and, and cities and like purposefully set up their camp their sleeping bags and tents, like, in the center of the town, like, to take it over, quote-unquote, and take over the, the pubs and really establish their presence. <laughs> I didn't know football got that deep, to be honest. Wow. As if it's, like, their territory for the day. <laughs> the second example is on holiday. Take, like, sort of previously sleepy and unsuspecting Spanish or Greek seaside towns okay and then brits go there like, i mean i'm talking about places like costa del sol ayanapa cavos etc now brits go there and completely overrun really the all the cafes serve british food all the bars have british tv shows it's the same for when brits decide there's a really great place to go on vacation well i guess you know as long as they're respectful or contributing to the local economy with the tourism i guess like it the 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 town after a while is probably like okay everyone needs to go like vacation's over people need to go home after a while but all in all it sounds like it probably helps the local economy at least with tourism and stuff <laughs> that's funny the town basically feels like croydon on the mediterranean personally i'm not a fan huh. number 20 you I, didn't, I didn't know about those British people do still have a sense of uh, wanting to take over, uh, whether that's football or vacation or uh, entire civilizations back in the <laughs> back in the uh, times of the British Empire expansion, whatever you want. All right. Next, uh, things British people love. Sunday roast. Sunday roast. I have learned a bit about Sunday roast. It's a fantastic looking invention. And I'm not surprised this is on here, although I, I did forget about this. Your mum's Sunday roast. Sunday roast. <laughs> we discussed that we're not a nation of gourmets, but we do love a good Sunday roast. And uh -huh. in particular, our mums or our dads or grands or grand... Your, your family's Sunday roast, right? The, the family? Your family has like a specific way of making the Sunday roast. Like it's specific. That's, that's actually really fun. It's kind of like how in America, every family has their own version of a Thanksgiving dinner, I think. This makes sense. I like this. Okay. Because it's the one that you're used to. Right. Now, a home-cooked Sunday roast, it just hits different to a pub <laughs> version. Okay. It's the one True. you've grown up with, right? It's, True. It's always going to be the best. Yeah. Now, Sunday roasts consist of a roast meat, like chicken, beef, lamb, or, of course, vegetarian options. You've got roast potatoes, uh, vegetables, you've got gravy, various other... Man, this is... I'm jealous. Like, 
do you, can you make this every Sunday? We only get this like twice a year at Christmas and Thanksgiving. This is a British people know how to make hearty meals. I tell you, man, grow up big and strong. <laughs> Look at this thing. This I mean, this is making me hungry, honestly. The condiments, personally, I love a Yorkshire pudding. They're pretty good, I've got to say, guys. So when you come to the UK, trying a Sunday roast is definitely a must. Okay. You've got to do it. Okay. And if you can get an invite to someone and have a roast in their home, even better. Okay. Number 21, not making a fuss or being a bother. <laughs> <laughs> I love how he switches between, okay, things British people love. There's very tangible items, real items, like tea, Sunday roast, that British people love. And then there's these, like, ideas, these philosophical ideologies British people love. We don't make a fuss, <laughs> which I really like. It's like queuing. Uh, British people seem just more respectful as a culture, orderly, empathetic. Um, whereas in America, I, I really do think Americans as a culture are more selfish, more concerned about themselves, don't really care if they impact other people. So making, not making a fuss, uh, that's not a big priority for a lot of Americans. So I actually like to see this quite a bit. This is one area of life that I think we're different to the Americans. Yes, yes. Uh, so an American yes. will tell you if they aren't happy with something, right? Whereas Brits, we tend to keep quiet. We suffer in uh... silence. Now, don't get me wrong. I think the American way is probably makes more sense, but... Now I see by making a fuss, he means complaining. Um, voicing your complaint. Amer yes, yes. Americans love to voice their opinion, voice their complaint. If they don't like their dinner at a restaurant, they're going to try to get their money back and get a new meal and get an apology. It is absolutely crazy. Like when, <laughs> when I really think about it, how true this is. And I think it's ama that's amazing for British people. But, kind of, you know, to his point, Americans probably, we probably get our way a little more often. By definition, we voice our thought and opinion more. Um, for good or for bad, for good or for bad. But we get our way more. Um, we just come across as more of a jerk and more annoying. So, I don't know. It's kind of a balancing act. You want to express yourself when it's important and it means something to you. But you also don't want to be a pain to other people as well. But I think it's, there's a healthy balance of both, I think. It's just not in our nature. Um, we don't want to sort of make a song and dance about something. So, All for right. example, uh, if someone is sitting in your allotted seat on a train, a lot of Brits will just sort of shrug their shoulders and find another seat right. rather than confront the person. Right. Now, that's not a rule, but I... Right, I have, like, this happens all the time at the movie theater where you buy a ticket for a specific, a specific seat in the theater and I have gone in and there's someone sitting in my seat. I bought my ticket early. I have a good seat. And I, I have to go up to them and, and <laughs> I pretend... I hold up my ticket and I'm like, huh, um, oh, sir, oh, it looks like uh, my ticket, it's, it says you're in my seat. I don't, I, the, it's what the ticket says. I don't know. And they eventually, like, they grumble and get up and move. And it always turns out that they have a terrible seat. They bought their ticket way too late. They were very lazy and irresponsible. And they're in the, like, bottom row. And they try to take your seat. So... Yeah, in America, you, you gotta live, you live or die by whether you're willing to, to voice that, uh, which is uncomfortable for sure, but I do think Americans are more used to it, and Americans are more willing to take your seat, so you almost are forced to be a little confrontational, even though you don't want to, yeah. I've done it, and I've seen people do it. Right. I guess we're just terrified of making a fuss. We don't sure, want to be sure. that person you know, right. that causes trouble or inconvenience for others. All right, let's... Uh, I think, a lot, like, a lot of Americans, certainly myself at least, like, I don't want to make a fuss. But you're kind of forced to do it. 
or you're just gonna like get taken advantage of sometimes. It's unfortunate. Anyway, moving along to underdogs. Like uh, British people love underdogs. Okay. Let's finish with one last observation. Brits love an underdog okay. story. Okay, okay. Maybe it's because we're a small nation, so we have this sort of feeling of kinship, but it's definitely something deep in our psyche. I, I think a lot of Americans enjoy a good underdog story. Who doesn't enjoy a good underdog story? But but I, I get what he's saying. Maybe Brits have more of a, a special relationship to this kind of thing. Like he said, because Britain is a, a smaller nation and can kind of relate a little bit more. Although I, I enjoy an underdog myself. Maybe it's because we're a small nation, so we have this sort of feeling of kinship, but it's definitely something deep in our psyche. <laughs> One of the great British underdog stories was Eddie the Eagle. Now he was an absolutely hopeless ski jumper Eddie in the, the 1988 Eagle. Winter Olympics. He came last. The guy was rubbish, but the country became obsessed with him. They even made a film about the geezer. <laughs> Eddie the Eagle, ski jump. That sounds very interesting. Uh, <laughs> this is like a true underdog story to Brits. Okay. <laughs> Guys, can you add any more to the list? Have I forgotten it? Okay. And, and with that, there we have it. That, that was very, very enjoyable, I gotta say. And this whole video was by Eat, Sleep, Dream English. I gotta give this a like because I liked that very much. Um, there were a lot of surprising things that British people love that I have never thought about before. The crisps, the pubs, the BBC, banter, fish and chips makes sense. I knew about that one, and tea. Discussing directions, um, Sunday roast, and not making a fuss. I like that one as well. And underdogs, I, I liked all these. This was actually super fun to learn about. And I feel like I learned uh, a lot about aspects of British culture I didn't even really know about and so that's always great i i enjoyed this anyway if you enjoyed this as well feel free to give this video a like or leave a comment perhaps with things that you love as a british person that would be very interesting to hear about and if you're interested in more videos like this me reacting to britain and british culture and stuff about britain that i've never seen before or learned feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching and see you next time.